For centuries, our kings and queens have been laid to rest in the finest tombs. But for 500 years, the body of one of them has been missing, our most infamous monarch, Richard III. Last summer, a team of archaeologists and enthusiasts unearthed a skeleton in a car park. No. No. That might just be the missing king. Of Richard III, one of the most reviled kings in British history. In the months since, scientists have been trying to unlock that skeleton's secrets and reveal its identity. This is the exclusive inside story of that incredible journey. I'm sorry, I can't and the discoveries along the way. The shape of the vertebrae changes as it goes down the spine. We'll learn how the man in the car park died. It's a very, very dramatic injury. And reveal his face for the first time. It doesn't look like the face of a tyrant. I'm sorry, but it doesn't. All of it building to one result that might just rewrite history. Wow, gender shocker in lab. I don't see bones on that table. I see a man. <laughs> Pictures of Prince Harry, so this morning's sun, they're in there. But if you're in Leicestershire and Rutland this morning, we have perhaps the most exciting story for a very, very long time. This is history being made in Leicester today as a search begins for the remains of a King of England. Richard III could be buried underneath a car park in the city centre, and historians and archaeologists alike will be eagerly awaiting developments over the next fortnight. It seemed utterly bonkers. One of the things you don't do in archaeology is you don't go looking for a specific thing, because the chances are you'll never find it. And you don't go looking for famous people. The world's media are here at the moment. i tell you one thing, it is very, very exciting. It's the first ever search for the grave of an anointed king, so to find him, it would be fantastic, really fantastic. I mean, we are pretty excited about it. I'm not sure that they thought bunch of cranks, but I think that they thought that, um, that it was a very long shot. There are people who have these great dreams of finding things, because as an archaeologist, I just know how many sort of variables there are at play on any excavation. So chances of finding Richard was a... I don't know, a million to one. Of all the kings and queens of England, one story has fascinated me since I was a kid. It's the legend of Richard III, the hunchback king with a withered arm, who murdered the princes in the tower and died in battle, yelling for a horse. Elizabeth I there, Henry VIII, her father, and... Britain's first ever recorded fat man. His father, Henry VII, who took the crown from Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth, and here he is. Wow. The legendary Richard III. Definitely see a kind of a hunch. I've come to this um, comedian, actor, so my introduction to Richard III was Laurence Olivier's depiction and he had this like i remember very vividly he had a it's like the kitty catcher he had this prosthetic nose and i think a protrusion of the chin and a sort of sets off clumping across the set i can smile and murder whilst i smile and cry content to that which grieves my heart and wet my cheeks with artificial tears and frame my face to all occasions the idea of searching for the bones of a king who was evil personified seemed intriguing enough. But then, on the way to Leicester, I started reading about the people behind the dig, and it got even more curious. This project began not with archaeologists or historians, but as the passion project of one woman, Philippa Langley. 
going in search of his remains. It's kind of the holy grail. Three years of basically non-stop, non-stop cajoling, non-stop begging in some places. From her home in Edinburgh, Philippa helps organize the Richard III Society, a group who believe Richard was a good king, horribly maligned by Shakespeare, and that this is a wrong that must be righted. Yeah, but we need the funding, that's the thing. Um... Philippa joined forces with a historian who was investigating the legend that Richard's body was unceremoniously hurled in a river after his death in battle. It became obvious to me when I looked into this story that it was one of the many myths about Richard III. John was interested in an old theory suggesting Richard's grave, in fact, lay in the church of a medieval friary, somewhere under the car park of Leicester Social Services. When we actually looked at the car park for the first time, when it was empty, lo and behold, in this very spot, there was a, a, a parking space with R marked on the tarmac. I got the strangest sensation when I was in that, that area, in that place. Absolutely knew that I was standing on Richard's grave. Hmm. More convinced than ever, Philippa took the project to the archaeologist at Leicester University. Initially, I thought, oh dear, it's somebody who, who thinks it's going to be really easy just to dig in the right spot. And, and find exactly what they want. But then it became clear that actually there was some very good, solid research behind uh, her idea of looking in the Grey Friars. Together they set out to raise the money. And when £10,000 in funding fell through, Philippa turned to her fellow Ricardians for help. Literally, within moments of sending out the first emails, they started coming back. And they started coming back from America, from Canada, from Australia, from New Zealand, from Belgium, from Brazil, Germany, Austria. In two weeks, not only did we raise £10,000, they'd raised more. As the cash was gathered, the university did their own research. Tracking the location of the friary through time, it did appear to be under the car park. What they couldn't tell was where exactly the friary stood or the church that might hold the grave. It was put two trenches in and hopefully find a bit of the friary that we could recognise. Um, if we could pinpoint where we were within the friary, then we could actually start looking for the church. Incredibly, the archaeologists' research set them digging right on the very spot where Philippa had her strange sensation. I was gobsmacked because the first part of the first trench was running right over the letter R. We were very on tent hooks, you know, hoping to see signs of war, hoping to see maybe some, some of the church floor tiles, some evidence of that sort. No, we didn't see walls, and no, we didn't see church floor tiles. We found leg bones. What's that doing, then? Well, it's bone. I think it may be human bone. I went in and carefully uncovered just enough of it to see if it was actually connected to an, and I found the other leg, the right leg, to go with the left leg. So at that point, I thought, yes, we've got a burial. But didn't really think much about it because I'd got no evidence at that point that we were inside the building, let alone the church. So we just carefully covered it back up and left it. The biggest, darkest cloud came over, and there was this incredible tempest. It really was like some... <laughs> Shakespearean scene. This tempest arrives the minute we discover human remains. If it was Richard, he was ready to be found. He wanted to be found. The joke doing the rounds in Leicester was that the only bones they'd find on this dig would be in a fried chicken box. In fact, ten days in, the search for the grave of Richard III is going surprisingly well. 
Realistically, I thought we'd be doing well just to find a few friary buildings, dig those, do a bit of sample excavation, close it up, and off we'd go. But it became clear pretty soon that there was going to be more to this project than, than we originally thought. We were finding things every day at lots of points. We were finding things every hour. The team have dug three trenches in all. So far, they've not only unearthed the friary, they've had a major breakthrough and found part of the church where they suspect Richard's grave might lie. It turns out the legs they found on the first day under Philippa's R are actually lying inside it. This is where Matt found the bones. Whoa, and they're going in. Looks, there's some pretty serious work going on there. The plan here is they're going to dig out another section of that wall there so that we can, so that we can get at the bone. A bone expert, Joe Appleby, has come to investigate whether these legs are attached to a complete skeleton. And Philippa is transfixed. I was just sort of watching Philippa. I thought this is going to be a long process. And she said to me, I think that's, I think it's him. I think it's him. And I just thought she was insane because I thought this is ridiculous. It's the first, the first thing we've found. What's the chances of the trench being cut in the right place? I mean, it was bizarre. Are you nervous about this? Uh, yeah, strangely, I am. Actually, I'm, I feel sick, which is a bit really? weird, isn't it? I don't know why I feel sick, but I do. I suppose it's a weird thing, digging up a dead body. Yeah, it is. And I think the whole point of this journey, this project, was to try and honour this man. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it might not even be him, but... Sorry. Sorry. Right. Just being a wuss. No, no, it's quite... It's quite... A, it's quite, um... Quite an emotional thing, isn't it, really? That's only struck me just now, just coming and peering in. This was someone's relative. Mm -hmm. Husband, father, brother, son. Yeah. Um, and, of course, it might not be Richard, but whoever it is was a person. Yeah. I think I saw what it meant to Philippa for the first time. She was, you know, in tears, more or less. And I thought, even though this king's been dead for 500 years, this means the world to her. Philippa's emotion seemed surprising because the Richard depicted in Shakespeare was not a man you'd shed a tear for. But I, that am not shaped for sported tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking glass. I that am rudely stamped and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph. Richard wasn't born to be king. It was his brother, Edward IV, who emerged from the Wars of the Roses with the crown. But, as Shakespeare tells it, Edward's early death led Richard to seize his chance, murder his nephews, the princes in the tower, and take the throne for himself. That is the legend Philippa and her clan are doing battle with. We have over three and a half thousand members worldwide. Worldwide? Frequently asked questions. Are you winning? There's a war being fought for the truth about Richard. The Ricardians say evil Richard was a myth invented after his death by the Tudors to justify their flimsy claim to the throne. And by the time Shakespeare wrote his play a hundred years later, this propaganda had taken hold. As I read more, I learned Richard was a good and just king. He didn't murder the princes in the tower. 
and it wasn't even a hunchback. Richard may have had a slightly raised shoulder from training for combat, but this is conjecture. So we're not going to find a um, this sort of Shakespearean. Now is the wind. We're not going to find one of those guys. I was starting to realize just how much was at stake on this dig. If the archaeologists find Richard and he isn't a hunchback, it would expose that Tudor myth for good. Then later that day, there's another breakthrough. The archaeologists digging near the bones under Philippus R find evidence they're in a part of the church called the choir, where the friars buried important people. Then Joe found something curious. I hear we've discovered something to go with our with our legs. Yeah, uh, Joe's just found a skull in the grave. It's a yeah. bit of a problem, though, in that it seems to be a lot higher than where we had the legs right, when we I found see. them. So we're going to have to clean down carefully and see if it is actually the skull for this burial. I'm quite excited because that appears to be a hole in the skull. Yeah, that's, that's not an old hole. That's, that's a hole that's been there for 10 minutes. The rest of the, the, the bones that we found so, so far are a good six inches below that. Um, and I cleaned this bit back yesterday to a much lower level without finding any bones. But we then needed to go further into this side mm. to try to pick up the whole burial. So I was just basically taking it down with this mattock here. Uh. Um, and unfortunately, that's gone into the top of the skull. So that's what's caused that hole. Right. So we're thinking that maybe the whole skeleton underneath, but these, these bones are on top. Yes, we think it's quite likely that, that this skull is actually not associated with the, with the skeleton underneath. The most likely thing is that it's going to be isolated and will then come down onto the burial. So what's the plan now, Joe? Just uh, keep, keep going, bag this up? We'll, we'll clean carefully around this and, and excavate it and take it out, and then we can carry on and work our way down to where the grave hopefully is underneath it. Yeah, well, we shall uh, leave you to it. Thank you very much. The skull of any skeleton we find would help us identify if it was the king. Medieval accounts of the Battle of Bosworth describe the last moments of Richard's life and the blow to his head that killed him. Right in the middle of the battlefield site here. In this area, in 1485, there was a marsh, and this was probably more or less where Richard died. <laughs> On the ground, he was attacked, killed by a blow to the head. His clothing, his, his valuable armour are taken away. Richard's naked body is left lying on the field. Subsequently, Henry VII needs this body because it's, it's how he's going to prove to everybody that Richard is dead. So he needs to have this body. He sends people over the battlefield to retrieve the body. Um, they find it naked. Um, we're told they put a, um, a rope round the neck, probably this was to drag the body across the field, and they take it to Henry, who then has it put over the back of a horse and transported into Leicester. The dead king's body was put on display in the city. Some contemporary accounts did say he was then buried in the Greyfriars, but a legend took hold that his body was hurled into the river. The story of the body in the river can only be dated back to 1612 and the mapmaker John Speed. He went to Leicester, looked for Richard III's grave site, couldn't find it, said he could only find weeds and nettles, and ah, he'd actually gone to the site of the Blackfriars Priory. And no wonder then that he couldn't find Richard's tomb because he was looking in the wrong place. The archaeologists were also convinced that Speed's map was wrong, which meant if Richard's body wasn't in the river, it was here, right in the area they were digging now. Everyone was super excited because all we had to do then was dig into these uh, 
into these graves and we would we would inevitably find you know some uh, skeleton or some remains and one of them we hoped would be uh, Richard and then we got this call from the skeleton we found on the first day uh, and Joe said I think you better come and have a look at this and I stood and I looked into the grave. I thought, I'm going to remember this for the rest of my life, this moment. You remember this morning we talked about the skull that we found, um, and we said that we didn't think that it could possibly be part of the same person as, as the, the legs that we'd found earlier because the orientation of it was completely wrong. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's true. The orientation is completely wrong for, for a normal body. Uh, but I've just been excavating the, the spinal column. And if you take a look at it along here, you can see that there's a really abnormal curvature of it. Um, mm. So what we're actually seeing here is that this skeleton, in fact, has a hunched back. Wow. No. Yeah. No. Do you mind if I sit on mud, honestly? Go on, have, have a seat. If Philippa had found Richard, this wasn't the Richard she was looking for. Thirteen days after breaking the tarmac in the car park, we were stood right on the spot of Philippa's R, staring down at a skeleton with a hunchback spine. We were all shell-shocked. The hunchback king was supposed to be a Tudor myth. Don't get me wrong here, right? But that curvature is a major curvature. I mean, yes. that, that's seriously something going on. So, that's, yeah, that's, that's how do really... you get armor on that? I, I wouldn't try, but you know. <laughs> Would that rule it out for you with your, with, with, you know, that goes with the stereotype, doesn't it? I haven't spotted a withered arm, so, you know, the oh. arms are okay. The arms are okay. <laughs> yeah. oh, some good news, though. But, of course, he could have been a hunchback, but still been the nice guy. <laughs> 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 Let's not forget that. It doesn't have to, you know, go along with all the, all the other myths, does it? No, no, it doesn't. He um, could have had some born with, with something, mm. you know? Um, it's just funny, we have descriptions of Richard by people who met him, and they don't mention it. Yeah. Then Joe dropped her second bombshell. There's a bit more. Earlier, when you were questioning me about the skull, I was a bit evasive about it. Yes. Um, there is actually a wound. It's not very visible on the surface of the skull, but inside the skull, you can see that some, some of the bone has broken away, and he's actually been hit, hit in the head with something. And when you turn over the skull, there's also some damage to the skull base. And that, that was before death. You can, can you say that, that that I can't, damage... I can't say, I can say at or around the time of death. I can't be more specific than that, I'm afraid. It's circumstantial evidence at the moment, but I think, I think just to be on the safe side, we might, we might do a DNA test on this one. I would say so. I think it's worth doing, isn't it? Okay. No, definitely. <laughs> uh, definitely. Yes. As Joe lifted the skeleton out of the ground, it began to sink in. This seemingly bonkers project might just have pulled off the impossible. Sally thought, hang on a minute. <laughs> it drove me to the head, east end of the church in the choir, curved spine. Have we actually managed to do this? I mean, the odds, if you calculate it, must have been incredible, and yet, by sheer fluke, we'd managed to put the first trench, and essentially the first thing we'd found in the first trench on the first day was this skeleton. Mm -hmm. That femur. Yeah, that femur. The spine was the last thing to be lifted. We needed to treat it with a lot of care, because this was obviously going to be something that was going to need to be intact and carefully looked at in the lab. Jo worked from the bottom up, and she'd got to nearly the last ones, and she'd lifted these two up, and um, 
There was this little fragment of metal underneath. I'm not quite sure what it is. I think it could be almost anything. Take it back to the pot. Yeah. It's found between two of the vertebrae. A bit of the corrosion's come off at this point, and it certainly looks like some sort of metal shaft. Anyway, where it was found is quite interesting because it was a. Where was it exactly? About there. Right in the middle of his back. Yeah. Or pike. The meter. end of a pike. Again, yeah. I mean, it could be all sorts of things. Uh, an X-ray will probably so... give it clearer definition of this. Okay, so an X-ray will yeah, take but you'll away see the through corrosion. the corrosion yeah. and see what the solid iron is still right. inside. Right. So. It does not point in, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. This hunchback with a head injury now had what appeared to be an arrow in its back. That was a very extraordinary moment, and I felt somehow sort of out of time, almost as if I wasn't there, but I was looking in. Whoever this individual is, he was brought here through a building which isn't there anymore, through doors that don't exist. He was buried under a floor that's gone. He's been here at least 500 years. Now he's packed in polythene bags in a cardboard box, and he's now going to be taken away. I was very conscious of this individual, trying to imagine how, if he was looking down on us, how he might be seeing what, what we were doing. I don't think anyone was anticipating actually finding him, so there was no um, precedent, you know. I don't think a king has been found in a car park before, not, not to uh, my knowledge anyway. So nobody really knew what the etiquette was, what were the rules to follow. What I'd quite like to do, but I don't know how you feel about this, mm -hmm. is um, the remains that we've uncovered. I know we don't know 100% if they are Richard's, yeah. um, but when, when we put the bones in the box, I'd quite like John has a Richard III standard. Mm -hmm. And I'd quite like to just put it over the box to, to get it into the, the van, if, if you're That's okay absolutely with that. fine. No, I mean, I mean particularly as you as, as a good indication that they're the right ones. Mm. That's fine. No, Is absolutely that all fine. right? Yeah, yeah, okay. of course. OK, thank you. Because we're, we're never going to do this twice, are we? No, no, that's you know, right. You know? Mm. And I, I would just like to mark it. It just seems right to put his colours over it. I think we'll get Joe, the osteologist, to, to take him off site. Joe, do you want to come and do this? tuning in this morning on what could well be an another great historic day. Today we know city. that human remains have been unearthed, but are they those of the last Plantagenet king? There's, There's been a major breakthrough in the search for King Richard city. III's final resting place. At a press conference later this morning, we could find out if Richard III has finally been found. OK, 
Okay, colleagues, good morning. My name's Richard Taylor. I'm from the University of Leicester, and I'd like to welcome you here to the City of Leicester uh, to hear an update on the university's search for Richard III. We have a man with what appear to be battle injuries who suffered from severe scoliosis, that is curvature of the spine, respectfully but modestly buried in a place of honour in a friary church. Clearly, we are all very excited by these latest discoveries. This is potentially a historic moment for the University and the City of Leicester. Researchers announced they found a skeleton they suspect might be the long-lost remains of Richard III, one of the most reviled kings in British history. His body was misplaced. There were rumors that it had been thrown in the river, but perhaps not. Perhaps it could be found here, underneath this parking lot in the center of Leicester. It was a bit of a grimace. Grimace. <laughs> so far, the piece is fit with some historical accounts of Richard's death and burial and could rewrite many of our history books. 527 years after Richard's death, we must now wait at least another three months to answer the big question. <laughs> To the world at large, the Leicester University team had found the bones of Richard III. The truth was more frightening. They still had a mass of obstacles in their path before they could actually prove this was the king. Hi. Hey, you must be Simon. You must be Lynn. I am Lynn. Very nice to meet you. Very nice to um, meet you too. <clears throat> you're the boss of this establishment. You're yes, the chief. Yes, I'm, I'm the head of archaeology and ancient history. Wow. This is the box here. This is the box. This is the box. Oh, wow. A... It's astonishing, isn't it? It's such a mundane setting. If this was like a Steven Spielberg film, there'd be a huge kind of white ET-like container with loads of dry ice coming out the sides and then blue flashing lights, but it's, it's just not that, is it? No, no, it's, it's a, a cardboard box. It's a cardboard box. That afternoon, Philippa and I were taken through everything that lay ahead. The skeleton was going to be carbon dated. Its DNA would be tested against a living descendant. The bones and their potential injuries would be scanned in 3D. And images of the skull sent to the best facial reconstruction expert in the country. They explained all of the tests that they were going to, to be doing and you know, I mean, it just ran and ran. These lists of tests went on and on and on, pages of them. And, you know, it's a really anxious moment because any one of these tests could, could say, well, that's it. No, it's definitely not him. All of this made me more curious than ever about the man behind the legend. It's nice to be heading back here to Richard's home, his home in the north. In his early life, Richard lived near my home in Yorkshire. As the brother of the king, he was commander of the north and by all accounts, a born soldier. He was in battle at 18 and in command by 25. With a wife and young son, he seemed to dote on. Ah. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of York. Feels very uh, strange coming back here. Because I must have been here a dozen times, 15 times over the, over the years. And always, you know, I've done my weathered arm routine and imagined, but now I know, now I've seen him potentially in, in the ground, his bones being brought up out of the ground. It's, I feel a bit uh, like that sort of sacrilege now, <laughs> to sort of lark about with his name, because he was, 
He was a real person. He was a real king, and uh, he lived here. I was becoming more and more intrigued by Philippa's version of Richard. She left me an interesting message about the way the people of York responded to his death. The day after he died at Bosworth, they said King Richard, late mercifully reigning upon us, was pitilessly slain and murdered to the great heaviness of this city. They were writing this when there was a new king on the throne. A couple of weeks later, they called him the most famous prince of blessed memory. And you know, that, that doesn't strike of someone who was a ruthless tyrant to me. The rival versions of Richard were so at odds, the good king and the bad, I wondered what historians made of it all. Why this man who'd ruled for just two years was still so divisive today. Was he well regarded? Was he liked by the yeah, people? Yeah, he was well regarded, very much well regarded. He, he, he became admired for his uh, chivalry. and He put himself out as, as a man who, who would bring justice and fair play. This doesn't sound really like an evil, murdering despot. Not at all. Now, that doesn't appear in any way whatsoever. All the contemporary accounts stress that in the 1470s uh, into the early 1480s, Richard was the loyal brother. Good old Richard. So he was loyal brother, a great soldier, uh, a fair arbitrator in, in local yeah. disputes, well thought of yeah. by the people of the North and his fellow soldiers. So what, what the hell happened? This is the big question, isn't it? I mean, yes. this is what everyone argues about <laughs> and debates. It was what happened in the Tower of London in 1483 that first split opinion about Richard. When his brother died, Richard made himself protector, guarding the interests of his nephew, young Edward V. But just three months later, he acted to make himself king. It was all very fast. It took everybody by surprise. The princes disappeared, the two boys. They were already being housed in the Tower of London. They were described by local London sources as having been, one of them said they were seen shooting, practicing archery in the grounds, and then were seen no more. I have to say, mm -hmm. I think they probably were dead. Yeah. But I would have killed them. Richard wouldn't, you would have killed I them. I killed them. I mean, you know, why, why do all that and then, have, and then still have the risk that they're there in the tower, they could escape from the tower, was, somebody else did it yeah. on his orders. If, mm. but it's not proved. It's, it, it cannot be demonstrated mm. beyond doubt. No, we just don't know. They disappeared. Yeah. They did disappear. From that moment, the battle over Richard's reputation began. 500 years later, that king was just possibly lying in a cardboard box facing a battery of tests to prove his identity. And one result was in already. The investigation of the arrowhead in the skeleton's back. Hi, Nick. How are you doing? Nice to Simon. see you, Simon. Hello, Cheers. hello. Philippa. Oh, Nick, nice hello. Nice to meet you. John. All right. So, you're going to tell us about the arrowhead that we found in the back of uh, our skeleton. What, 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 have, what have we discovered? Here's the the actual object, it's still no easier to see exactly what it was than when it was covered in lots of wet soil. And uh, the only way really to find out what it, what it might be is to x-ray it. That's the initial x-ray that we did. What it looks like is a, is a slightly tapering okay. piece of iron here. You know, you've got a yeah. shaft there and you've got a suggestion of some little barbs coming off mm -hmm. uh, the side there. What we did then was to start having a look at the kinds of arrowheads that we might expect to see at this kind of date. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, there are some similarities yeah, there, definitely. Yeah. But that wasn't really enough. There's a couple of things about the arrowhead concerning me, really. If we have a look at a replica arrowhead of the kind that was around in the late 15th century, you can see, yes, it's got barbs. They're swept back close to the body of the arrowhead. You know, it's designed for piercing mm. uh, body armour. 
What we did was to take another series of x-rays just to see what we've got. And the second thing that I was concerned about was this very thick white line at the top here. Looks like a screw or a neck. Well, <clears throat> what we've got here, unfortunately, um, is a bit of iron that was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I'm afraid it's a humble nail. It's a humble nail. nail. Yes, and probably a Roman nail. Uh, just fortuitously in the burial soil yeah. uh, and just happened to be right next to the spine. A nail. Not what we were, <clears throat> the start no, we were I hoping mean, for. Did they use nail guns in medieval battles? Not as far <laughs> as I'm aware. Am, no. I, am I clutching at straws? Yes, yeah, <laughs> we're definitely clutching at there's, straws. There's nothing to be gained by no. going down that avenue. No. <laughs> Looked so, up nail gun on the internet yeah, yes. and it said yeah. started in the 70s. Mm and not the 1470s. That's right, yeah. Oh, dear. It was a troubling start. If the arrow was just a nail, what other disappointments lay ahead? Was our royal skeleton really just a monk in serious need of a chiropractor? For two weeks in October, the box containing the potential bones of Richard III sat in a locked room waiting for an appointment at the local hospital. Somewhat bizarrely, they were going to scan this medieval skeleton in the same machine they used for living patients. We're going to take a CT scan of the skeleton. The idea of that is that it will give us a, a good 3D record of it and it will enable us to look in more detail at the nature of the trauma on it and also potentially at the um, abnormality of the spine. Cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world, scarce half made up, and that so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I halt my head. The shape of the vertebrae changes as it goes down the spine, and one of the problems with this is, of course, that the, the vertebrae are not completely normal. They're the finger bones. I'm just trying to organise so I can work out where we are. The images from this scan will create a 3D model of every bone in the body. They'll allow Joe to investigate the skeleton's apparent hunchback, the nature of its head injuries, even the weapon that killed him. It was just possible this science might rewrite the history of our infamous king. And all over the world, Ricardians were ready to do battle. History plays were plays. They are not histories that they can prove now that, okay, you see, he wasn't an archbeck. That was a lie. Well, so, <laughs> we think that in the skeleton that he does have a hunchback. But... What do you mean? How do you fit a hunchback in an armor? Um, he was quite handy with swords and... The idea that he and... was in any way uh, uh, seriously physically incapacitated is utterly ridiculous. Uh, I personally don't believe that he knocked off his nephews. I think they were in fact hidden away. I think anybody who claims they know what happened to the two boys is deluding themselves. It's all pure speculation. You think he murdered the princes in the town? No. He stood to gain, didn't he? No. No. No? No. A little bit of truth can be spun, political spin, and, and turned into something else. The Tudors had no right to the crown. They knew that. They say the winners are writing history, right? It's like this is fresh. This is like just happened. It's like, you know, like the result of some election that happened yesterday. They will fight it. They will fight it with passion. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Really nice to meet you. In every way, this medieval skeleton was coming back to life. The images from the CT scan were now with a specialist at the University of Dundee. Using technology developed for criminal investigations, she was going to reconstruct the face of our skull in layers of muscle and skin. 
First of all, just first impressions of this skull is that it's got quite a long grass style, in other words, not very strongly masculine features. Um, so it's, you know, it's an interesting skull to look at. It's got quite a, a lot of teeth that have been lost from the mandible, so he's going to have quite an interesting face. With the process that we follow for the reconstruction, is to use little virtual pegs and attach them to the surface of the skull so that it gives a kind of contour map within which we can work to produce the depiction. Next step is to add the anatomical structures, starting with the eyeballs, and basically slowly build the face from the skull out to the muscle structure. As we put the muscles onto this skull, the face starts to develop. So we can start to see the shape, especially around the lower face, around the jaw. None forswore me in my mother's womb to shrimp mine arm up like a withered shrub, to heap an envious mountain on my back, to shape my legs of an unequal size, to disproportion me in every part. Nowhere was myth and fact more tangled than in the question of what Richard actually looked like. His surviving portraits, painted after he died, were a masterclass in spin. It does include two layers, the layer of truth, which is certainly the likeness. There's no doubt about that. Okay. That is quite like what Richard looked like. But the whole type was slanted as soon as the Tudors started applying propaganda to the matter. Oh. It was of great importance, the Tudor dynasty, that this man was a villain. It was right. essential. Otherwise, there was no reason for Henry to be on the throne. So they tampered with it? Oh, yes. Oh. The shoulders. This one right. is slightly higher than that one. Oh. And they made a great play of the theory that he was disabled, and at this time, a disfigurement of this kind would have been assumed to have been due to the vengeance of God. This is the one in the Royal Collection. He looks meaner. It's undoubtedly been tampered with. The shoulder See. has been raised. Wow. His hands are claw-like. Oh. His thumb just seems to be a spike. It's quite disturbing, isn't it, really? It is, it's like yes. something out of a so, horror film. Yes, well, again, this is propaganda. It is quite subtle, actually, isn't it? I would have gone monobrow. Do you know what monobrow is? So you it's mean, all so across. It's right so it looks, across the middle. Yeah, can you give him what? But they haven't done that. They've been a bit subtler. They've no. narrowed his eyes. They've given him a pointy thumb. Exactly. It's quite good, isn't it, do you think? Do you I think, think it was pretty cunning. Certainly these things were done, and it's much easier to exaggerate than it is to invent. Right. You exaggerate a little tiny fact to make a, a, a monster. And if he had a deformity, a slight deformity, then it wouldn't have been mentioned into his face or in his reign, but the minute he was dead, buzz, buzz, buzz. If this skeleton was Richard, that fabled deformity was going to be classified and defined by experts for the first time. For Philippa and me, this process was also our first sight of the skeleton since the dig. Hello. Hi, Simon. Hello, well, Philippa. Here we are. Blimey. We've got the skeleton here laid out, and we've reproduced the curve as best we can. Just to show you a little bit about some of the bones we've got here, on this vertebra, you can see how we've got bone formed in the ligaments that connect this vertebra with the one above, which showed the curve would have been pretty stiff. Would he have had the hunchback that was reported in the Tudor times? Well, hunchback, yes. He would have had an abnormal curve and an asymmetry to the chest wall. Mm -hmm. Whether his right shoulder was higher or lower, it's not easy to tell from the actual excavation. But if we look at the end of the clavicles, 
we can see how the one on the right is definitely a different size and shape to the one on the okay. left. It's much bigger on the right than on here. Mm. So he may have found that the shoulders may have been held in a slightly different position. Wow. It's a lot to take in, isn't it, Philippa? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Uh, it's mm. just... Uh, It's all quite clinical, isn't it, old sort of lay it's down It's very like clinical. This. It's really it's difficult awesome. seeing him mm. laid out like this. Mm. Guys, I'm sorry, I can't... <laughs> it's quite, over, quite overwhelming in there. Are you OK? Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. I don't see bones on that table. I see a man. I see a living, breathing, a sort of human being. And you feel um, like you've got to know him, you know, o o over the years. I mean, it's years that you've put in mm -hmm. into this, and it's kind of like hearing that diagnosis is, um... you know, it's just laid out mm -hmm. for the world to see again. You know, it's a uh... But then do you feel what we're doing this time is trying to, you know, there's a lot of interest in this, um, but we're trying to, I guess, get the truth out. You know, but we do, we have to get to the truth. Yeah. And you're we right, have to, we have to do it. And, um, yeah. Should we, should yeah. we, are you ready to go yeah. back in? Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. All right, let's go. Mm. Hi, guys. Oh, yeah. You OK, hey. Philippa? Yeah. yeah. I'm really sorry to hear you saying he's got a hunchback again. It was kind of... It just knocked me for six. Well, it depends entirely what you mean by a hunchback. A hunchback isn't a medical term. It's just a, a popular term to mean someone's got a spinal deformity. Is it not visible, then, in in his clothing or is it not visible in his body or is it visible in his body but not in his clothing? You well, know? scoliosis is always much more apparent when someone is wearing no clothes. So a lot of people will walk down the high street today and you will not know they have a scoliosis. Perhaps 1% of people in Britain have a scoliosis of some kind but it doesn't mean to say that it's severe enough to impact on how they live their lives and so most of the time you would not notice they ever had one unless they were on the beach. This deformity was not the classic hunchback of Notre Dame. The curve was sideways. If this was Richard, outwardly he would almost certainly have looked and walked like anyone else. The one shoulder was probably a bit higher than the other. Back to the sort of the Shakespearean myth. Would he have had a withered arm or any sort of oddness in his in his arms? If you compare humerus on one side with the humerus on the other, they're exactly the same length. Same for the forearm. They're symmetric on both sides, so there's no reason to think that one side was withered compared with the other. Mm. One thing Joe and I did notice was that the radius bones here are relatively gracile or feminine. Is there anything we can categorically say at this point would rule him out? Or as, well, of as course, if this so. was a female skeleton, then that would do it very definitively. And um, the gracile nature of the skeleton is, is something that, that might set a few alarm bells ringing. Um, there are also some features on the pelvis, this, this feature here. The sciatic notches here are wider than we would normally expect to see in a male skeleton. This is a feature that, that varies, and in fact we have data that's been done on burials of known people from, from Britain in the 19th century that show that, that you can have a, a feminine sciatic notch and be male. Other areas of the pelvis suggest that this probably is a male skeleton. Um, some of the aspects of the skull suggest it probably is a male skeleton. Tudor's missed a trick there, didn't they? <laughs> you know, could have said he had a hunchback and lady's arms. That would have made Shakespeare's play very There is actually one of the historical sources, um, and I'm afraid I forget which one, that, that refers to him as, as fighting surprisingly well in battle, considering that he was lacking in masculinity. Really? So, um, so there, is, there is actually some historical wow. backup for that, that view. Wow. 
gender shocker <gasps> in lab. I wasn't expecting uh, that even to be a doubt. Wow. Hmm. Royalty is a queer old thing. Between the current queen and our potential king, there are 23 different monarchs. But not one of them directly related to Richard. Since the day our skeleton was discovered, the hunt has been on for a living descendant. Someone from the male or female line whose DNA might be a match. This is it, Belgravia workshops. So we're in the right area. So far, the closest descendant on the female side, and potentially the newest member of the royal family, looks to be a cabinet maker called Michael. It's a weird, funny history, isn't it? I mean, given different set of circumstances, uh, I'd be looking for Michael in some palace somewhere or a castle, but such is the strange course we're here in North London. I mean, it's nice, but you know, you know what I'm saying. If DNA from our bones matched Michael's, our skeleton would be a king. <laughs> Hi. I'm looking for. Um, Nephew of uh, Richard III. Have I found him? I think you found one. <laughs> found one. An intriguing archaeological mystery in England took on a Canadian twist today. To find out if the skeleton is genuine, they're testing the DNA Mike against Ibsen, a descendant. A 17th generation descendant of the king's sister. His DNA will be compared with that of the skeleton. So, Michael, what is your exact relation to the dead king? Well, I'm uh, a nephew in the 17th generation. 17th. It's <laughs> actually not that far away. Part of my physical being is directly related um, to the family of Richard III. And that's... It, it makes you stop and think. Um, and it's, it's, I, I find it somewhat overwhelming at times. You know, they used to call Richard the last of the Plantagenets. Well, it's not true, because you're... you're the last of the Plantagenets. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a faint resemblance. I mean, if you imagine Michael with... with a wig and... Yeah, it's something there, I think. Just adding some skin. We do this as we would with real clay, really, is just add kind of balls of clay over the muscle structure and start with quite a rough shape and then it becomes more and more detailed as we move along into the process. Really from the muscle structure onwards, we're starting to see what the face is developing into. Some of the skin there over the top of the forehead, so you're starting to see the shape of the top of his head. Where should Richard III's final resting place be? Live on PM Night, two MPs will tell us why. The appropriate why. final resting place for him would be Leicester Cathedral. What? Worksop is the halfway point between York and Leicester. But who on earth wants to go to Worksop? I mean, we need to have a proper historical... The sense of expectation in the country was rising. But by mid-December, we still couldn't prove the skeleton was Richard's. And one test had us all nervous. The carbon dating that would tell us what century our bones came from. That's cut and dried. If we've got um, 
a 14th century, a 13th century burial, you know, it's game over, and it's definitely not Richard. The date we needed to be in sight of was the year of Richard's death, 1485. We had sort of hopes that we'd get within 80 years, mm -hmm. was, the, was, the, was the thing, so we could eliminate any of this sort of earlier medieval burials. So let's have a look and see what we've got. Oh, God. Position at least <laughs> no, tell us whether we're in the right it? ballpark. Well, yes, this, yeah, is, this is the one, because if this is out, this is then what this we've been is, this is end all, thinking. Really. And, it's then where... yeah. and the initial dates have come in, and they, they're, they're, they're suggesting sort of 1430 to 60, which is a bit on the early side. Mm, but because the individual had a high-protein diet, and particularly was eating a lot of marine fish, by eating marine fish, the marine fish are absorbing lots of earlier carbon-14, and, right. and it's distorting the date. So then it's remodelled. It then gives us a 95.4% probability that it's AD 1450 to 1540. Say that again, it was 14? Well, 95.4% probability is 1450 to 1540. Crikey. So that's, what, that's exactly what we're, we're after. It is. It is. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's, that's great. the story of this project. Yeah. I'm, I'm in a 95% plus uh, category now in terms of confidence. Well, Philippa only needed an hour on the, uh, in the car park. Absolutely. So. That's where my divining rods. <laughs> right. <laughs> An average person in medieval Leicester wouldn't be having a very high protein diet, not much fish and not much meat. And, uh, you know, most, most people would be eating pottage and sort of vegetables and things like that. Mm. Within the friary, they probably have quite a, bit, quite a bit of fish, although it's quite a poor order, so mm -hmm. uh, maybe not that much. Mm -hmm. So it's a high-status individual, which is yeah. also which is another bit of evidence. Yeah. Which another is piece of evidence, which helps. Yeah. It all yeah. helps. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Five months on from breaking the tarmac, evidence was mounting that our skeleton was indeed Richard III. A medieval grave in a sacred place, a curved spine and bones dated to the 15th century. The cabinet maker's DNA was now being processed alongside the skeletons and the 3D face was being transformed into a physical head. This is really nice, isn't it? The detail that you can see on here is fantastic. In Leicester, one last investigation was underway. A trauma specialist and an armory expert were trying to match injuries on the skull to medieval weapons. Scanned across it in two different directions. One direction, it looks a bit like a scoop. Yes, that's definitely, yes, a blade coming across. In the accounts of Richard's death, they describe him being brought down in a melee of men, with one surging forward with a poleaxe to kill him. No one knew if they were accurate or part of the myth spun after his death. On this image, it looks very scooped, and then this image here, it's much flatter. Perhaps something like an axe blade or, or, or a, a quite sturdy um, sword. As they identified each injury on our skeleton, medieval accounts and 21st century science began to tell the same story. Everything suggested that for the first time, they might be able to tell the story of Richard's death. Leicester had pieced together what looked to be the last moments of Richard's life. And joined by a forensic pathologist, they were starting to identify the fatal blows. We found a series of injuries on the skeleton tells us about the moments leading up to his death and immediately afterwards. There are some, some injuries that are very obvious but there are also some injuries on here that are, that are much less obvious. If I just move it in the light, you can mm. see that there's a, a bit of a slice here. Um, and we think that what's happened there is perhaps somebody has taken a, a slicing action at him with a, with a sharp-bladed weapon, and it's just nicked the top of the head. It's the blade is sort of a scooping depression, and there's still striations on there, so the, the blade came, came in and, and, and out. He will have charged into that battle in full armour. By this time, the helmet is, is, is away. You don't get a, a wound like that or other wounds that we're we'll seeing wearing a helmet. This helmet would have come off before he got to the 
he would no, he, he'll, he'll, have, he'll have probably got to that point mm. and then in the in the ensuing melee mm. which will have been possibly in, it would be a number of people very very tightly packed together in this very very small area and a helmet could have been knocked off so then we also have this this much more noticeable but still quite small wound um, it's a, a penetrating injury of some kind you can see there's just a a very small entrance wound on the on the top of the skull. It strikes me that this is actually the result of, of probably a, a, a dagger. There is a certain type of dagger at this period called the rondel dagger. There are illustrations which show you holding it in one hand and then basically about pushing it down with the, with the other hand. So you, you, you've got this extra strength as well. So this yeah, is a man right. who's not on a horse as well. He's already off his horse. At this stage, mm -hmm. he's off his horse okay. as well is recorded by even those who don't look upon him favourably as, as he, he fought manfully to the end type mm -hmm. of thing and scenario and this is what I think some of these wounds are showing. He, he, he was, he was mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. in the middle of it right mm -hmm. to the end. Mm -hmm. And then of course we, we, we come to the, the most obvious of the wounds on the skull which is this very major mm -hmm. slice that's been taken off and we actually have part of the, of the slice of bone that's been cut away here and that, that shows us that it must have still been in some way attached, perhaps, as a flat afterwards. It's a very, very dramatic injury. Um, again, you're talking about a lot of force behind something to actually cut through the skull like mm -hmm. this. But certainly, if you look at where this injury is, the brain would be visible through that. So I think that's, that's the blow. What did it, probably? Mm. That's the fatal blow. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think yes. so, yes. You don't walk away from something like that. No. Not even today with modern neurosurgery. No. That, that kills you. Mm -hmm. Brutal. Brutal. Mm. Yes. Considering the amount of damage that he has received, what might be very apparent when we're looking into this face is that actually it is complete. That is it's sort of quite obvious if you think about it for a moment. People actually wanted to see it was Richard. Mm -hmm. yeah. They wanted to see his face. There is the, the king or the pretender, the mm -hmm. usurper. There he is. He is dead. Come and see for yourself if you don't believe me. So then there's one final wound on the skeleton. And again, we're very sure that this is something that happened after the death of Richard. And that's on the pelvis. There's actually a line across oh, yeah. here. Mm -hmm. And if we look at this, there's an equivalent line on the part of the bone that's broken away. We can see that something's come in from yeah, the back. Yes. It's penetrated slightly to the front there. So what we think is that somebody has actually stabbed him with some kind of a bladed weapon. This seems to fit in with the idea if we imagine and accept the accounts that he is bound over a horse, trussed, and legs are dangling one side, the, the arms the other side. It means his buttocks are about head height as he's being led from Bosworth to Leicester. And that is such an opportunistic target for somebody with a, with a dagger just to go like that. Into um, the buttocks? Yeah, into the backside. In, in. Mm. Why would you bother stabbing someone you know, and the bomb as they're passing by, that wouldn't happen to an ordinary... It, it, it heads in a certain direction. Like no, I it's... think it, it's all... We're always very careful in forensic pathology not to overstate it, but it's all highly suggestive. And uh, you take everything in context, the injuries that he's got, as you said, the stature, and you've got to start getting close to a serious conclusion. I must admit I was quite sceptical at the beginning, but I... Mm. Um, the more I've looked at this with Joe and, and everybody else, I've, um, I think it is. The combination of the, the curvature of the spine and the, the pattern of injuries, it's not just the single injury that caused death, but the pattern of the injuries suggests very strongly that this is him. It was pretty, uh, it was pretty brutal in there. I mean, to have a, 
chunk taken out of your skull and then something resembling a hammer blow and then a you know spike through the head and then, it, and then the back of his head taken off and his brain spilling out uh just um and then let's face it you know after what we're all kind of you know inferring from what they're saying is a poor guy you know he got stabbed you know in his ass basically and um but at least that was what happened those were brutal times that was you know medieval battle was pretty pretty sort of ruthless um and also what it confirmed for me is that is Richard III. There is no way, for, in my mind, this is Richard III. If that is not Richard III, that is one unlucky monk. Beautiful, isn't it? So this is where this is where it all happens, John. Yes, yes. I was thinking about this last night, I was sort of going to bed. One of the things that came into my head is how brave he was, I suppose, as a leader, because I was thinking that he's the last English king to die in battle. You couldn't imagine a king now. And he he took it upon him himself. He said, I'm 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 gonna fight. Richard thought that he was going to win. He was pleased when he heard Henry Tudor was coming because he thought that he was going to settle this issue. And all his preparations for the battle showed confidence. That, that's a sort of comforting thought yeah. to me, that it must have come as a shock to him, but hopefully that it came as a last minute yeah. shock. And then, yeah. and you know what? He was a warrior king and he died as a warrior king. You know, and maybe that's what he that's what he wanted he thought if i'm going to die then i'll i'll die that way yes i think at the end yeah. that is what he wanted mm -hmm. yeah everything suggested the skeleton in the car park was richard but one final piece of proof was needed if its ancient dna didn't match a living descendant then the truth of his identity would always be questioned i genuinely don't know what the dna result is it seemed only right that Turi um, should tell Michael first. Because it has much yeah. more an impact on him than anybody else. Mm -hmm. It's quite big news to absorb, isn't it? Michael. Yeah. Hello. 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 Hi. Hi. Nice to see you again. <laughs> Good to see you. Hello. Hi. Yeah. So. so. If you look at the DNA of Michael and you look at the DNA from the skeletal remains, there's a match. Wow. Blimey. The DNA evidence points to this being Richard III. Wow. Yeah. We have a match. <laughs> <laughs> so we can categorically say we found a king in a car park. Yeah. Yes, we yep. can. Yeah, um, we can. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Any viewers thinking of going to the local car park and digging <laughs> it up, this is a very unusual situation. Okay? Not to You're be not, tried not to be tried <laughs> in your local social services. These people are experts. <laughs> <laughs> On a grey London day, three and a half years after starting her quest, Philippa has reached the end of her journey. I feel quite nervous, do you? I'm shaking. <laughs> I am. The same science that can put a face to an unidentified victim of crime will allow us to stare into the face of Richard III, a king of England who died 500 years ago when he was just 32. Something's happening. Hey, come on in. Hi. Let's go. Okay? Yep. <clears throat> okay. There right. Right. Um, right, okay. And now open your eyes when you're ready. Yeah. Wow. Uh -huh. Remarkable.
You can kind of see the man, really, can't you? Doesn't look like the face of a tyrant. I'm sorry, but it doesn't. And there's no Tudor mythology all over him. No, he's a bonny lad. Yeah, <laughs> he is. He is. He's very handsome. Mm. It's like you could just talk to him, have a conversation with him right now. <laughs> it's been a complete roller coaster ride. And to see this now, to sit here four years on, after everything that's happened, after everything that we've been through, and to see the real Richard III, um, I'm just full of joy. What I found most fascinating about this journey is we've had two sources of information. There's the science side and the historical side. And the science information sort of gets narrower, it gets more concrete, you know, so we, we know what he looked like and how he carried himself and ev even what he ate, how he died in battle. But the more you look into the historical side of things, the narrative of Richard's life, if you like, the murkier and murkier it gets. But I think that's what I've learned to love about history. It's all open to interpretation. Everyone's entitled to their opinions. It's like two football commentators arguing over the same penalty decision. They've both seen the same things, but they both come to different conclusions. And I guess the conclusion I've come to is that I am a Ricardian. Wow, I never thought I'd hear myself say that. My name is Simon Farnaby, and I am a Ricardian. Good morning. My name's Richard Taylor. I'm from the University of Leicester, and I'd like to welcome you here to the city of Leicester uh, to hear an update.